All right, I think we're live. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the MongoDB live streaming. Um, so we're streaming in parallel right now on Twitch and YouTube. Um, we're going to be doing some Pokemon shenanigans in this uh, particular stream. Um, but I'm with my uh, co-streamer here, Otto. Um, hey, Nick. Otto? Good. How are you? I'm doing uh, great, man. I love the suit. I uh, I didn't go all out as you did, but I just got a little Pokemon EV shirt. <clears throat> Love the love the Pokemon though. Uh, so we got we got to dress the part because we're going to be doing some uh, exciting Pokemon related activities here. Yeah. Uh, so should we maybe start it off by showing what it is that we're going to be building with uh, various programming technologies? Let's let's do it. Let's show the demo of the app, and then we'll get into live coding, and we're going to build the app that we show from scratch. We're going to take about an hour and a half to two and walk you through everything so that we'll share the, the code repo afterwards. So if you want to build on top of it, you can. But for now, let's take a look at the app that we'll be building. So yeah, definitely. You want me to switch it over? To, oh, you already got it. Perfect. There we go. So uh, we're calling this app Poke Battle. It's going to be a Pokemon battling app where you can fight a friend in real time as long as you have uh, their battle ID. So when you get to the application, you know, you can start a new game or you can join an existing game. And if we start a new game, the first thing that's going to happen is you'll be taken to a character selection screen and also given a battle ID. And the battle ID okay. is how you connect with, uh, with the Pokemon. Yeah, why don't and you drop that ID in the chat? Let's do it. Uh... I have so many monitors and still trying to get. And I, I wanted to reiterate here that we are live. So if you um, want to engage with us, uh, please do. Actually, I can't copy it from that chat. Do you want to go ahead and switch it over to our private chat inside of our tool? Uh, yes. I thought for a second I could copy it from there, but it wouldn't let me. Private chat. There we go. Sweet. I am joining it as well. Everyone who's uh, tuning in is welcome to join it too. Um, let's see. I think I'm player two, right, Otto? Yep, you are player two. I'll be player one. And uh, I'm going to choose Eevee. All right, so I chose Pikachu. All right. And uh, so, you know, we only had limited time to create the demo, uh, or, you know, when we we're planning it out, we were trying to figure out how much content can we actually create in an hour and a half. And the one thing that we aren't going to have time for is uh, being able to figure out how long it's, uh, you know, being able to choose players. So we're going to work off of the honor system. Uh, typically, you know, I could just hit headbutt a bunch of times and win, but uh, it looks like Nick already attacked. So yeah, I'll I'm already next. destroying you while you're not paying attention. <laughs> so I'm going to attack with uh, Tail Whip. Um, and it attacks Pikachu, you know, you lose 15 health points. And all of this is made possible thanks to Socket.io and MongoDB change streams. So all the interactions get automatically broadcast to all of the connected clients. And, you know, I may I make an attack, Nick makes an attack, it's automatically updated on both of our browsers. And eventually somebody is going to win. So <laughs> looks like Nick won because my health points went below zero. And uh, so that's the game we're going to be making today. And after this, you know, player two wins. We can hit the play again button, go back, and start from scratch. I, I think um, I think that's a pretty good uh, pretty good demo of what we're going to be building. Uh, Nick, do you want to talk a little bit about the technologies that we're going to use to build this? Yeah. So I mean, uh, what you saw on the front end was a React application. I think we're using Next, right, Otto? We are uh, to, to make it, uh, and that'll that'll render it uh, server side, correct? Uh, uh, parts so of it will. Yep. Parts. Yeah, and then on the back end, which you haven't seen yet, uh, it's going to be all Node.js. It's going to be using Express. We're going to be using Socket.io to handle our our socket connections, and we're going to be using MongoDB for storing uh, not only information about each of the Pokemon, but the battle information. So. Um, you only saw one battle, but there could be a hundred different battles going on right now, for all we know. Um, so it's it's going to be interesting stuff. And I will share the link to the uh, app as well if you want to play with it. Uh, I'll post it publicly so that you can create your own battles and play around with it, interact with it, try to break it. Um, we didn't do a whole lot of 
error handling. So if things um, if things break, you know, let us know and, and we'll fix it. But we just wanted to build something in in a couple hours. Yeah, there's going to be some edge edge cases that could break this thing for <laughs> sure. And maybe depending on how quickly we can uh, get through uh, some of the building, maybe we try to eliminate those edge cases. Right, Otto? Sounds good. Yeah. I want, uh, I want to give a mention that uh, we have Shiri Cabral uh, proctoring the chat for us today. Um, and probably a few others will probably pop in from MongoDB as well. Um, so if you have a question that we don't uh, get to um, because we're too slow to look at it, uh, Shiri will probably have already gotten it for us. Um, so big thanks to her. Thank you, Shiri. <laughs> um, all right. So uh, I think we kick it off by uh, taking a look at um, what our data model is going to is going to look like so the the data that we'll be working with um yeah do and, you want to share my screen auto uh sure let's add your screen and uh, is it showing yes it is sorry all right perfect uh yeah so we're gonna look at the data model i'm gonna do a lot uh most of our modeling in uh visual studio code so i'm gonna be using the visual studio code extension uh for interacting with mongodb uh, we actually did a, a live kind of podcast on it in the past. So if you wanted to learn more about installing this this plugin and, and using it for yourself, I highly recommend it. It is my preference when it comes to uh, working very quickly with MongoDB outside of a programming technology. I, I don't know what your preference is, Otto. Do you use Compass or uh, Code or CLI? Uh, I use a mixture, but I do love the MongoDB Visual Studio Code plugin for just very quickly being able to make changes and see them reflected. But yeah, uh, definitely. So let's see here. What, what what screen am I on here? All right, perfect. Uh, so I'm actually going to show MongoDB. I've already set it up. I've already got some clusters going on. Uh, we'll probably switch between my cluster and Otto's cluster today. Uh, but I'll connect to mine just for the time being. And I will choose to create a new playground. And what I'm going to do is, uh, I don't know, I'm going to, Maybe save it inside of uh, the directory that I'm currently in. And I'll call this one, uh, how about Pokemon? Sounds so like this, a uh, solid name. <laughs> yeah. So my thought process behind this one uh, is that um, this, this playground, while it could do anything we want, really, we're going to isolate what this one does to just working with Pokemon uh, data. Not battle data, Pokemon data. Uh, and a lot of this is going to be kind of made up because uh, we don't have a, a Pokemon data set with MongoDB, um, and we don't want to just rip off another data set like Poke API, which is a great uh, a great tool as well. Um, so we're just we're just gonna we're gonna make it as as realistic as possible based on memory, right, Otto? Sounds good. Uh, so <laughs> let's let's start by defining which database we want to use within Mongo because I've already connected to it. Um, we're gonna. I'm just gonna say game. Uh, this this doesn't exist already inside of my MongoDB cluster, uh, but uh, by the time that I run this and and we and we get through it, uh, it will have been created. And I'm going to. Uh, it's a very fitting name. Yeah, do you have a better name for it? No, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> we could call it Pokemon Battle if we wanted to, um, but I I don't want to get confused with uh, some of the collections that we're gonna make. Yeah. Uh, so since this is going to be kind of our playground, let's let's make sure that we start with a clean slate every time. Uh, so I'm going to say DB, and this is going to represent uh, a Pokemon collection. So I'm just going to call it Pokemon, and I'm going to say drop. So every time we run this, it's going to drop our collection. We're going to start from scratch. Uh, and this is this is useful if we wanted to kind of uh, bootstrap any, uh, any other kind of uh, clusters for development purposes, uh, rather than having to, to create it manually down the line. Uh, so let's get some data in there. Uh, we want some Pokemon data. We want to know what their health points are. We want to know what uh, the power points are, their name, uh, things like that. Uh, so let's go ahead and say db.pokemon.insert. Uh, and I'm going to insert many. Um, we could just do one insert uh, per uh, operation here, but we might as well get it all out of the way with one, one operation. So the insert many probably makes the most sense. And that's going to take an array of objects. And this is where we can define our data model. So Otto, what, what should we typically have uh, for a, a Pokemon document, at least for this example? 
Just um, kind of basic. Well, I mean, we'd want to have the the ID. So, you know, it's letting us know each Pokemon is going to be unique. So we're going to have an ID field that we can set to really anything. We could set it as a MongoDB object ID. We could set it as a string. Um, or we could just come up with our own convention. And I think uh, maybe having our own convention might be better and easier to visualize. So why don't we set it to... Yeah, because if I if I go back here, right? If I... We... we uh, Let's just create a new game. We need to be able to easily reference which Pokemon we're choosing, right? So mm -hmm. it might make sense to, to hard code a, a value on a per Pokemon basis, right? Yep. And yeah, since Pokemon consistent. are already numbered, I mean, we could just say maybe something like Pokemon and then its unique number in the in the Pokedex. Yeah, something like that, maybe. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, let's go ahead and say we'll just do the, a few of them. And Otto, you'll have to help me out with some of the the Pokemon. I don't, for example, I don't remember what uh, Snorlax's Pokemon ID was. <laughs> uh, but some of the starters for sure. I can. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm getting a request to zoom in on my code editor. So is that just better? Just a little bit. Maybe one more. One more. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks for speaking up. Looks great. Looks um, great. Yep, much better. Um, so we'll have the the Pokemon's ID, and then you know we should have the name of the Pokemon. So let's say number one, Bulbasaur. I think everybody Perfect. has this ingrained in memory. Um, after this, this the was the starter Pokemon I used in Pokemon Red on Game Boy. <laughs> uh, I was always more of like a um, Charmander starter, oh, but my gosh! All right, have a oh, fire Pokemon. <laughs> um, was it? it? It was, yeah. At the start, it was always an advantage. <laughs> um, and then, um, you know, let's have the Pokemon's uh, health power and uh, and PP, which is what does PP stand for? It's like their it's power points. Power points. And uh, or it usually it goes by like MP in other games for like magic points, or you could make it up. It could be mean something totally different too. Yeah. Um, so let's say, you know, HP and, you know, since we're defining all of this data, why don't we just say a hundred and yeah. say that, you know, we'll just keep it consistent PP 10, you know, we're not going to have a whole bunch of different. And we probably want this to be moves, numeric data, right? Not, not strings. Mm -hmm. All right. So we have that and then uh, we need some moves, right? Yeah, and then I would say let's give the Pokemon some some actions to do, and this we can store as an array in MongoDB, so we don't have to create a different collection, right? For for moves, we can just embed it in here, um, and I think for moves, you know, we'll have the move's name, how much damage it does against HP, and then how much power it uses, um, and then uh, power you said, mm -hmm. or PP, right. PP. All right, so uh, what do we want to say for the first one? Oh, well, you know, let's talk well, about Bulbasaur's um, attacks, you know, like something specific to him, like like Vine Whip might be uh, a good first attack. It's a classic, <clears throat> classic move right there. Uh, I think, you, I think uh, Bulbasaur knew that one uh, at the start, right? Or very soon uh, after receiving yep. it. Uh, so the damage, relatively low, right? Yeah, maybe like 10 or 15. Let's say 15. And then the power points used, oh, we only have 10, so maybe let's say two. How do you feel yep. about that? Yeah. We uh, could always adjust these later. Uh, all right, let's 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 create another move. Cool. Um, so Bulbasaur is like a little, almost like a like a dog, right? So, so I think maybe having a move like like, like, like a, a tackle dog. move, <laughs> kind of like a, like a green vegan dog <laughs> <laughs> i haven't heard that one before <laughs> i don't know what, what do you guys dog. what do you guys think in the comments <laughs> what would you equate bulbasaur to <clears throat> maybe not a vegan dog <laughs> more like a, a head of lettuce right there <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> I love it. Um, so, so I was thinking for the second move, maybe something like a like a tackle, so that he can yeah. um, something physical. Um, and damage, once again, uh, fairly. I don't know. What do you say? Ten. Ten. Yeah. And then PP. 
This is like the most basic of moves. I think pretty much every Pokemon in the game learned Tackle at some point. So we'll say... If I recall correctly. Maybe one. Yeah, I think it's like one of the most common <laughs> common moves. that You can even teach it to like a Magikarp. <clears throat> we got we got a comment coming in that says it's more like a turtle than a, than a vegan dog. <laughs> huh. I would say Squirtle is more like a turtle. <laughs> but that we is can disagree. true. That is true. Um, and then... You know, let's have the yeah, final sure. final move be a, a rest move, uh, just so that you know the Pokemon can recover some some health or or PP. So it's not going to do any damage, and instead of consuming PP, let's have it recover um, a couple of points, maybe like two or three. Yeah. Um. So like that. That that looks perfect. Um, All right. So that's going to be our data model for the Pokemon. And um, so why, if you want, Nick, if you want to create a couple of a couple of additional Pokemon, I can yeah. uh, show the, the Next.js application and um, show what we're going to be doing while you load in our, our data set and insert it in the, in the collection. Yeah, and just for the sake of, uh, because I think we've got a lot more streamers on than the first five minutes that we were streaming, maybe go through the demo one more time. Sure. Uh, as well. I think it's worthwhile. I see a lot of people talking about it in the chat. Cool. Well, uh, welcome everybody. If you're just joining us, what we are building is, and I'm going to switch over to my screen. I already but, did it for you. Sorry. Awesome. Uh, what we're <laughs> building is a uh, Pokemon real-time battle app using MongoDB, Socket.io, and uh, Next.js. And essentially what's going to happen is uh, you go to the application, and in this case, we, we already have a link posted. Uh, poka-battle.vercel.app, so we're hosting it on Vercel. And uh, you can either create a new game or join a game. And uh, since I don't have an active game running, I'm just going to click the New Game button. And our first state is going to be the Pokemon selection. So it's going to be a two-player game, and you can either play it in the same browser, or if you share this battle ID and you join it from that first screen, you can play it from anybody kind of across the world. But for the demo, I'll just say I am using it. Uh, I'm playing it locally with two players. So I will pick Eevee as my Pokemon. And when I select it, you know, Eevee is highlighted. And we're going to have Eevee fight uh, Mudkip. So once player one and player two have a Pokemon selected, uh, they're going to go into the fight stage. And again, here. How, how did you come up with Mudkip? Is that like, does that hold some kind of uh, personal relationship to you in some, some fashion? Because that's totally random. <sighs> Mudkip was like a meme for a while. Uh, was it? Back, I feel like it was because I keep I kept hearing about it. And um, when I was loading the initial data set here, you know, all of the Pokemon we have are part of the OG 150, except Mudkip. Yeah. He was in like Gen 2 or 3. <laughs> so I, I just thought we'd mix it yeah. up a little bit. And it looks like somebody uh, jumped in uh, and uh, played I the game you. for me and won. <laughs> 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 Love it. So uh, yeah, it's a it's a real time app. So as people are joining and using the battle IDs, they can uh, jump in and play, and then whoever at the end wins is uh, is going to be be the winner. Um, and then if we play again, start a new game. You choose your two Pokemon. You have them fight, and then at the end, whichever Pokemon uh, whichever Pokemon reduces the others to um, health to zero is going to be the winner. Uh, so, so that's our demo. How many Pokemon do you want me to add? Because it's taken me a while to add these. Um, we could just have the the original eight that that we have in the demo. Um, I think that'll be good enough. All right. Well, I'm not I'm not quite done yet. So, you said you were going to talk about the front end a little bit, right? Yeah. So, um, like I said, we're going to be building this uh, as a Next.js application. And for our starter, all I did was, um, you know, create a um, run npx create next app call it pokemon battle so we're just creating a um next app from scratch just a default app and i wanted to do this so that to show you we're not like adding any magic to it um started it in visual studio code and then the only thing i changed was in the package.json uh the port that next.js is going to run on and since we're going to have our backend express server run on port 3000 I just had the um, next app running on port 3001. So whenever we run npm run dev instead of 
by default running at localhost 3000. It's going to run at uh, localhost 3001. And I will zoom in so you guys can see a little better. Um, and then from this point on, we have our Next.js app started, created, and we are kind of good to go. Now, you know, we can go in and clean up this code. Uh, I just wanted to kind of start from scratch, but right now I'll go in and let's open up our index page and we can remove all of the kind of built-in classes that, that are in the starter pack. So I'm just gonna delete everything here and we'll say, um, and I think I did add enough uh, Pokemon now, um, so, but keep going. Don't stop yet. Okay, perfect. So we'll uh, just get this started. We'll uh, say Poke Battle. Uh, if we go back into our app, we have Poke Battle, and then I also want to bring in Tailwind CSS so that we can um, we can have a good <laughs> so that we can have a um, you know our design implemented pretty quickly instead of running through and you know trying to write custom CSS. And I'm just going to do this um, the old traditional way of just dropping in the style sheet. And we want to apply it to all of our pages. So in Next.js, if you're not familiar, there's this underscore app.js file, which uh, is essentially kind of the parent component that controls everything else. So anything we add in here is going to be loaded on all of the pages. So what we're going to do is um, we're just going to add in the head of our docs so I can do Thanks, Rohit, uh, for this. the compliment. And actually, we want it here in our underscore app page. We're going to say. Um, <laughs> I got a comment here from Shiri that's pretty funny. Vegan dog reminds me of vegan hot dog. <laughs> so Oop. we'll say head, and then we're going to load in our style sheet. And then let's also give our application a title and we'll say Poke Battle. And then we'll need to, we don't need the global style since we'll have them here, but we are going to import head from next head, which is going to allow us to create this component. And then we'll just need to wrap these in an empty div to make React happy. Ahmed, we're gonna we're gonna uh, jump back into the the data model soon, and then we're gonna build up the back end. So the back end is gonna do most of the heavy lifting uh, for this. The front end is just a bunch of buttons on the screen uh, with Tailwind. So it's uh, it's work in progress. We're gonna we're gonna build something interesting from scratch, something that you can very easily reproduce uh, quickly. Yep. So we have our application set up. It's Poke Battle. We have uh, Tailwind brought in, and we are good to go. So let's go back to uh, Nick's side of things and continue working on our data model and uh, creating our, our back end. So, <laughs> all Nick, right, yeah, just switch over to my to screen again. Got it. Yeah, all right. I should be zoomed. I had to zoom out again because I, I couldn't work with it this zoomed in uh, and get them in fast. But I, I added a bunch of stuff. I also added artwork. Uh, so, we had copied down some links. Uh, so, we actually did rip this off of Pokey API. Um, it's just the easiest way to do it for this short example. Uh, but props to them for having such an awesome data set. Um, but added a bunch of random stuff in here, um, which should be good enough for our example. Um, and we could always change it, change it later if if things come up. Yeah, no big deal. We could swap them out. Uh, so if I were to run this, um, it would it would insert. It'd probably give me some metrics around uh, the insert operation. But what we probably want from this uh, this playground is if I scroll down uh, to the next step. I probably want to say db.pokemon.find and just list out uh, all of the records that were inserted just to be sure. Uh, so I'm going to run it. Ooh, that's a new one. Did I get disconnected from uh, MongoDB? Or do I have an error somewhere? Hmm. Legacy octal little. Uh, I assume this is line thirty-two or one thirty-two. Let's see where. One. Ah, there's a leading zero. Ah, let's try it. Let's see if that works. All right, oh. that's better. Uh, so it inserted it all into MongoDB. 
Um, so at least it gives us something to work with. So when we want to do lookups based on uh, what moves to, to, to present on the screen or how much damage everything does, um, it, it'll be very helpful. Uh, so the next step is we probably want to design uh, what our battle documents are going to look like, right, Otto, before yep. we even start writing code? Yeah, absolutely. And um, while you get set up there, uh, th that trailing zero, um, I actually learned about this yesterday. Um, so if you're working with octals, especially in uh, in JavaScript, if you start with zero, it treats it as an octal. So if you put in a like zero five two, it's gonna it's not gonna be fifty two. It's gonna be translated to base eight fifty two, which would be really? I don't know somewhere in the thirties. But yeah, I, I read an article about it uh, just like a few days ago, and I thought it was I thought it was kind of a cool cool tidbit that we ran into this issue. <laughs> nice. Uh, so I use a different uh, playground here for this one, just so that way we can keep it kind of isolated and, and clean so that way it doesn't cause any kind of confusion. Uh, this one uh, will also use the game database, uh, which is now created because I had ran uh, the Pokemon.mongodb MongoDB playground. Uh, but this time the collection that we're going to use in this database, uh, how about we just call it battle? That um, sounds good. Or battles. Should we do plural, singular? What do you prefer? Um... Let's do uh, let's do battle. Singular. Yep. All right. Um, and for this one, this uh, we're only inserting a document to show what our what our model is going to look like. In reality, uh, these documents would be created by the Node.js backend uh, because um, it's all it's all client it's all client created uh, versus the Pokemon uh, collection, which is all of our uh, core data. Um, so let's go ahead and say uh, insert. We'll just insert uh, one item. So it'll be an object rather than an array. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a battle, what do we have for a battle auto? Um, uh, so we're going to start with a with an ID. So, so to be able to keep track of um, unique battles. And that's just going to be a random string of characters. <laughs> um, from that point on, we're going to have two objects representing player one and player two. Um, and for camel case or, uh, yes, Bob. please, uh, camel, camel? case, uh, right. what do you guys think in the comments? Does, does anybody have a preference one way or the other? Uh, I think we're going to keep it camel case, but I'm always curious what other people think. Um, and then just to keep this example simple, I think the players, all they're going to have is a Pokemon. So we'll just have an object underneath, um, within the, the player collection, and it's going to be whichever Pokemon that they chose to battle with. Um, and, and that's also going to be a, an object itself. This this is going to be an object, you said. Mm -hmm. So rather right, than, so what... than referencing a Pokemon, we're going to embed the entire Pokemon document um, in right. our, our battle collection. So what should, we, what should we add in here? We should add everything? Yep. We're just going to take the entire Pokemon um, Document and place it uh, under the under the Pokemon. So what, under the what we're going to do one. then inside of our front end is we're going to take the data from the Pokemon collection and add it to a Pokemon uh, battle document anytime we want to use it. Basically, correct. Got it. All right. So we had. Uh, uh, are we including the ID? Probably right. Yep. So ID. Actually, would it make sense just to copy what we have? <laughs> yeah, I think so. To just copy like, or you can even copy oh. the same Pokemon twice because. They are going to be treated as unique. They're going, to, they're going to fight each other. I think just maybe for confusion, maybe we don't do that. Yeah. Two different Pokemon. All right. Let's so that's one. Up. And then and, we're going to do uh, the same thing for player two. Was there a Pokemon in there? Or is it? Uh, should I remove this nested child? There, there is a Pokemon because in the future we All might right. add, you know, whose turn it is and you know, some additional information about the player. Yeah. Um, but for right now, I, I think just kind of giving us room to, to add on into the future without too many changes. I think just keeping a Pokemon for now might work. Got it. And so that was Bulbasaur. Maybe this time we do Squirtle. Yeah. The turtle. <laughs> Squirtle the turtle. Right. And uh, I guess Bulbasaur will have an advantage here. Uh, in this case, well, not in our game because we don't have any kind of weakness or, or strength uh, attributes applied. That's true. <laughs> uh, why doesn't this look right? Do I have an extra? I feel like I probably have something extra in there. 
I didn't intend it all the way. My editor's going, uh, it's spazzing out. All right, there we go. Okay, perfect. All right, so that looks good then, right? I think so. I, I think that's what our battles um, should look like for now. And again, this is a very simple use case that we can add on yeah. into the future. But again, you know, with MongoDB, we're nesting this information all in one collection in one document. Uh, rather than having to reference the Pokemon collection yeah. separately to get the Pokemon and then battles from somewhere else. Yeah. So and I think I, this I, works. I think where this might be valuable as well um, is, I mean, we could do, like you said, a lookup operation or multiple operations to get the data every time uh, through uh, an ID relationship. But because we're storing it in the battle document itself, I mean, maybe maybe we change uh, something about Bubble Store later. We want we want this to kind of ref, be a snapshot of this battle, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. So if we did a, a lookup, it wouldn't be a snapshot anymore. It it evolved with whatever we've evolved the uh, Pokemon document with, um, and that's not a bad thing. It's just uh, maybe for this example, we don't we don't want it to evolve the two the two documents. We want a snapshot. Right. Yeah, I think you hit the nail right on the head. I, I think you know if you level up Bulbasaur and he earns a new technique, if you go back into you know, see, seeing that initial fight, you want to see his initial move set and, and how he did instead of what his latest information is. <clears throat> exactly. Uh, so I didn't run this. Let me just uh, go ahead and say uh, db dot, we call it singular, um, and I'll just say find. And we don't we don't need to do the find. It's just I want to show what, uh, what pops up here. Yep. Uh, so it looks like it worked this time again. Uh, so that's good. Uh, so wonderful. Uh, so we've got data inside of our cluster of MongoDB, um, and we've got two collections. Should we jump right into the into the uh, backend stuff with Socket IO? Yeah, I think that that makes sense. Um, so we'll build out the backend, we'll build out a couple of endpoints, and then we'll start integrating the real time functionality and start working more on the front end. Perfect. And we're we're actually using MongoDB Atlas um, for this right now. I know that I didn't. Uh, I didn't share how I connected really. I just um, connected with Visual Studio Code extension, but I'm, I'm connecting to an Atlas cluster. It's actually the free Atlas cluster, so M0. Um, hmm. So it, it's more than enough to handle what we're what we're up to. And uh, Nick, somebody commented at, uh, commented that in it should be Player Two instead of Pokemon Two in your oh, uh, good catch. In, in it's in the battle .mongodb doc. Uh, battle. All right. All right, so I chose player yeah, two. Player two. Good, good catch. I'm glad somebody's paying attention. Um, and let me drop it so that way we can just repopulate it. So db dot battle dot drop, and uh, we'll just rerun it and problem solved. So good catch. Oh. All right. Um, so I opened up a terminal inside my Visual Studio Code. I'm just going to create a new Node.js project. Uh, I'm going to say npm init uh, to initialize that, that package JSON file. And I am going to uh, create a new file. I'm going to call it uh, main.js. So touch, it just created a, a main.js file right here for me. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to install some dependencies. So I'm going to say npm install. Uh, we know that we're going to be using MongoDB. We're going to be using Express. Uh, we're going to be using socket.io. But uh, we're also going to be using uh, cores. Uh, so because, uh, like Otto said earlier, we're going to be running the back end on port 3000. And what did you say the front end we're going to operate on, Otto? Uh, 3001. So we'll be yeah. neighbors. And because this is this is JavaScript, uh, it, it's going to give us a hard time with cross-origin resource sharing if, if we try to operate on two different hosts or two different ports. So I'll say cores. All right, that was fast. Um, all right, so then let's uh, let's start including those. So I'm going to say um, Mongo client, uh, and that's going to be equals require MongoDB. I'm going to do the same thing for Express. And keep your questions coming uh, inside of. Sorry, right, I'm trying to line. post. I'm trying to post a link and I uh, added a dash to it like three times incorrectly. So ignore the tilde. <laughs> All right, I saw a ton of tweet messages come in on, uh, on the chat there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.
technology is hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, cores equals require cores. This is just basic uh, express just... kind of setup. Uh, so let's let's initialize express framework. So we're going to say uh, equals express. Uh, and then now we want to set up our socket IO uh, because we're going to be using, uh, we are going to have some endpoints just for fiddling with for, for express, but we're, most of what we do is going to be handled with, with uh, socket IO. Uh, so I'm going to say uh, constant HTTP. And a lot of this is just ripped off straight from the socket IO documentation. Uh, but we're going to say require HTTP. Uh, I'm going to say server passing that express framework app uh, initialization there. Uh, I'm going to say uh, constant, uh, so IO for socket IO, and I'm going to say require socket IO. Uh, but uh, we also need to pass an HTTP. Now, there's another thing that we need to do still. Uh, so because, uh, once again, we are operating on different uh, ports, uh, we do have to worry about cores for socket IO, just like we had to worry about cores for express um, so we do have to pass in uh, another configuration object for for socket io uh, for for defining what's allowed inside of um, cross origin for for socket io uh, so i'm going to say cores i'm going to say which origins are allowed uh, for this one i'm just going to say all origins are allowed with the wildcard star character i'm going to say methods be consistent here uh, so methods, uh, this is going to be an array of what methods, uh, just the, just the crud stuff should be fine. Uh, update, wait, it's not update, it's put. <laughs> and, uh, so we had a question, Nick, on why are we destructuring Mongo client out of MongoDB? Um, and instead of just using like require Mongo client, and that's because we're, we're destructuring, right? We're just trying to get a specific, yeah. um, class outside of the MongoDB package instead of bringing in the whole uh, yeah. package. I mean, like if we were using, uh, if we were letting MongoDB handle object IDs for us, we would we would, could also do this. And then we can start working with object IDs, um, but we don't need to, we, we only care about the Mongo client. Yep. Uh, so the methods, we define what, what methods are allowed here. And then finally um, the headers. This isn't even the fun stuff yet. This is just setting up uh, Express and socket IO. A lot of this, a lot of this, you can copy and paste from their website. But uh, just walking through it, actually headers. I don't even. Maybe we just uh, leave that blank. I don't think we need any headers. Um, and then credentials. If we wanted to allow credentials, uh, it should be fine. That's kind of the 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 norm when it comes to cores for um, I think any programming technology, right, Otto? Yeah. Those are the those are the questions you have to satisfy. Yep, that, that should do it. Um, and uh, then we had another question pop in. Uh, why not just use, or why aren't we using Mongoose? Um, and I think, you know, the reason we're not using Mongoose for this is the MongoDB driver is incredibly powerful. And I think in some ways, especially for smaller apps, a lot easier to work with. You don't have to define a schema. We can just query our, our database, like, we could just ask for the data, store data in there, and we're not um, we're not enforcing any sort of scheme or even defining it. Uh, so it would be for our example here, it would actually be more work to add Mongoose in than just use the MongoDB driver um, itself. But both are both are great options uh, for for building MongoDB apps. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so where were we? We got uh, the socket IO set up. Uh, well, let's finish configuring uh, Express. Um, so we're, we know that uh, I think I think we're just going to be doing GET requests, right? So we we probably don't need to worry about JSON payloads and stuff, at least not yet. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to say app dot use, and we're going to say course. Um, and then we're going to say app dot listen. Uh, we're going to listen on port three thousand. Um, and we can say something like console dot log listening at 3000 um, and this is it'll just start serving now to help us out so that way i don't have to start and stop this application a million times during development i'm going to install another package i'm going to say npm install nodemon and this is going to be a development dependency 
Um, and this will just uh, watch our project uh, file and restart it for us every time there's a change. It'll make life just a little bit easier for us. Um, so I installed it. I can add it to the package.json as a script. I'll say start nodemon, and then I'm using the main.js file. Now if I went back, I can say uh, npm run start, and uh, anytime I make a change, it'll just reboot itself. Perfect. Um, so far, so good, right? Now uh, we need to worry about uh, connecting to MongoDB because we don't want to connect every time an API endpoint is requested, and we don't want to connect every time uh, a socket IO um, interaction happens. We want to connect when that ser when the application server starts. Right. Um, so let's go ahead and define a client. Maybe we we could do it down here after the setup of of Express, uh, but we're going to say something like uh, Mongo client equals new Mongo client. Um, and then what we would do is we would provide it a connection string. Um, so if I went over to my web browser, I do have Atlas up. I can go ahead and I can, I can click on my cluster information here for connect. And I can say that I want to connect my application. I'm using Node.js. Um, so I'm going to copy it. So I'm going to go back into um, my code. I'm going to paste it in. I'll actually drop it to a new line just so that way we don't uh, risk going off the screen here. But I'm going to paste it in. It's going to ask me for some uh, username and password information. Um, so I'm going to go back into Atlas. And I'm going to create a new database user. Um, so I'm going to say um, add new database user. I'm going to give it a, a, a password. I don't know. Uh, that's a user. Uh, let's go ahead and say stream streaming, maybe. Uh, I'm going to say Pokemon1234 is the password. And I am going to give it specific permissions so that way it only can access uh, the database that we plan to use rather than every database um, in my cluster, just for safety reasons. Um, so I'm going to say grant specific privileges. I'm going to say that it has read and write. And the database we called it game and leaving it blank will will allow access to all collections so all collections in the game database is probably fine um, and just top it all off so no one uh, even though that i've kind of added an allow list to my ip address i'm still going to make this a temporary user so when our stream ends um, nobody can go in and, and try to log in anyways um, so double protection there so double i'm going to say add user yeah uh, so it's deploying. I can go ahead and go back into the code and start popping that in. Uh, let's go ahead and call this username streaming. Let's go ahead and say that this is Pokemon1234. And the database is going to be game. Uh, so it should, should be good. Uh, so that's our client. Uh, let's go ahead and connect to it now. Uh, so this would happen inside of our listens. So when everything's kind of firing up, um, it is asynchronous, so connecting to MongoDB and getting our collections, it's, it's asynchronous. Um, so rather than dealing with promises directly, uh, let's just go ahead and make this an asynchronous function. Um, and with that, we can wrap everything in a try-catch block. And then what we can do is we can say console.error, ex if it fails for some reason. And we can say await uh, mongo client dot connect, uh, and then if it doesn't error out, we've connected to MongoDB. Um, so not not too bad. Um, we want to get um, a handle to our collections, which would be Pokemon and Battle. Um, so let's go ahead uh, and maybe create a, an object uh, outside of our listen function, so that way it can be used pretty much anywhere in our. Uh, globally within our application. So we can say something like uh, bar collections, and this is just an object, mm -hmm. uh, because then we can say something like uh, collections dot uh, Pokemon equals uh, Mongo client dot DB. And we could, we could create variables for this so we don't have to type it out or hard code it as well. I mean, for all of this, we should probably be using an environment variable or environment file. Uh, rather than hard coding it, but this is just an example. 
Uh, yeah. You should follow your best uh, production deployment strategy, however you feel uh, the best about it. <clears throat> yeah, we are going for speed, not uh, not perfection, but we still want it to be quality. Yeah, quality and hopefully a little easy to understand. Uh, I don't think anything that we're going to be doing is too too outrageous inside of our application. Uh, you could definitely make things really, really complicated if you wanted to. Uh, uh, Nick, you're being called out for using a var instead of let. Oh, man. <laughs> Killing me. All right, I'll use let. <laughs> uh, as somebody who uses JavaScript all the time, I can, I can honestly say that I don't... Uh, I don't truly understand the difference between how they're scoped. I know it's a scoping issue, but I don't know. They they all behave the same to me. <laughs> uh, I must be a, a bad JavaScript developer, right? <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I still catch myself um, using var everywhere. I, I think, like, if, if you're just learning JavaScript right now and you know using let and const and you know that being your workflow. <laughs> It, you know, once you learn it, it's like you can't go back. But if you grew up using var, uh, switching is it's kind of difficult. I know. I'm 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 old. I I grew up using var all the time. <laughs> I don't I don't even think I don't even think constant existed when I started using JavaScript. <laughs> so what are you gonna? I don't do? know. All right. So it's let now. All right. Everyone should be happy now. I'm gonna do the same thing for our battles. Um, I'm going to call it plural for that, even though we, we did singular there. Yep. Uh, so we have a, we have a reference to each of our collections being used. So that way we can use them, um, uh, inside of our other areas of the application. Uh, but just, just so that way we know that we're good. I saved it. It automatic, re automatically rebooted. Um, uh, it's yelling at me for the unified technology, uh, topology. So I'm going to add that in, um, although it, it won't stop your application from running. And, um, the reason that we connected to to Mongo within that callback when we started the server was so that we can reuse the connection pool essentially, right? So we're not making yeah. a connection every single time to the database. Uh, we do it once the app starts, we build up a, uh, a, a connection pool, and then every time we need to talk to MongoDB, uh, it can just be done automatically for us and we don't have to yeah. worry about that handshake and the, the delay yeah. in securing the connection. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter what database you use. There's always going to be a, a finite number of, of connections that you can have. Um, so you don't you don't want to try to connect every operation. It's all bad. All right. Well, so what do we got here? It looks like it's running. I don't have any endpoints, uh, which is fine. But it, it connected without any issues, um, and we've obtained uh, references to our uh, collections. So let's. Um, What's what's next, Otto? Should we should we create some API endpoints just to show that we can access the data um, that we've created with the playground? Yeah, I think we should because we we've, we've loaded sample Pokemon into our collection and we have a battle. So I'm thinking let's create two endpoints: one to get a list of all the Pokemon and one to display a list of all of the battles that have happened or are ongoing. I think that yeah, might be. For sure. um, and we'll use these and API endpoints in our next JS app to to get the data and to get the battle and um, to go from there. But the real time stuff is going to be socket IO mm -hmm. and change streams, which is going to be fun. That's the fun. That's the fun part. This is still. This is all just setup. Still, we haven't actually I, done anything interesting. I know, right? <laughs> <coughs> we'll get there I, soon. I mean, though. setup isn't that bad. No, 40, Forty-one lines that you can probably create a template somewhere and reproduce it every time you want to use it. Same you, setup all the time. But you want to have that good foundation at the beginning because now, you know, building out the rest yeah. of the functionality is going to be quick. Yeah. Uh, this is also going to be asynchronous because we're working with uh, a remote connection there. So rather than working with promises kind of raw, uh, we're going to use async and await. Uh, so we'll have a try catch. Uh, what do we want to do? We want, probably want to say... Uh, maybe re response.send uh probably some kind of message like a like a 500 saying yeah something something blew up yeah uh hold on ex uh i think dot message and this should be a uh status mm -hmm. 500 i don't know 500 is kind of super generic server blew up error uh which is fine for us uh, 
Otherwise, if it didn't blow up, uh, now we could actually uh, do some magic, right? So we're going to say it. let. I'm going to use let. Hopefully <laughs> I don't disappoint anyone again. Uh, we're going to say result equals um, await collection. I think I used plural. Yeah, line 26, plural. Uh, and I'm going to say Pokemon. And I'm going to say find. And I'm going to use, it's, this is like essentially the same thing that I used inside the playground, except for this was DB. So we have the collection name, we have a find. It's kind of the same thing. That's the beauty of, of uh, playground, in my personal opinion, and just the just the uh, MQL in general. It's, it's pretty consistent across the board. Uh, right. No matter how you plan to use it. Yeah, the, the and, API is pretty oh. standard. Um, and then the reason, so with the find operation, what's going to happen is it's going to spit out all of the Pokemon we have in the collection, right? We're not passing in any any limits, any any sorting. Uh, we're, we just want all the, all of our Pokemon that are in the database. I see all kinds of shade coming through the chat out of the corner of my eye. What is this? Always find new ways to disappoint us. <laughs> <laughs> Tons of shade over there. No, we love you, Nick. We give you a hard time because you're you're so good at what you do. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm gonna say two array two because find. We're expecting more than one result, uh, yeah. or it could be no results for that matter. Uh, but it's going to be an array rather than using a cursor for this example. We won't we won't use cursors for this time. Um, all right, so we have a result. Uh, I'm going to say respond uh, response dot uh, send result. This might be a point where we could actually try it. Uh, yeah. So we have the endpoint. It's running. I can open up Postman here. Let me see if I can zoom in. Is that too big now? Or is that perfect? Looks good to me. Uh, anybody in the comments uh, have issues? Just let us know. But uh, I think I think it looks okay. Sweet. All right. So we have uh, localhost, and this is Pokemon, and it doesn't Moment expect of truth. anything. All right. Oh. So um, it looks good. Um, so this is just our raw data. It's exactly what we expected. There's no filters. Uh, it's just return everything that exists in that collection. Um, so a good start. We'll we'll do the same thing for battle, just so that way we say we can, and we're going to use it a little bit in the front end as well. Um, I can actually clone this since it's near duplicate to the the same thing. So this is uh, battles, battles, and battles, and same thing, right? Same thing, yeah. Perfect. There we got is. one battle in there, or yeah, there should only be one. I didn't share anything yet. Um, all right, so perfect. Uh, so that's just the the rest part of things. Now, now we get into the socket IO stuff, right, Otto? Yep. Or ha have I have I missed anything that we should be covering as of uh, as of now? Um, no, I think we are uh, we're good so far. I think um, a good next step would be let's go ahead and uh, work on the front end a little bit and get our kind of foundation going and interacting with some of these REST endpoints. And uh, once we have that in place, uh, we'll go back and add the socket IO and and add the real-time functionality when it makes sense. Does that work? Oh, yeah, all right. Yeah, okay. let's switch over to your screen then. Cool. So and, uh, I'll, I'll start moderating the chat. I wasn't moderating it before. Awesome. Well, time auto, for me. Auto had it be covered. Time for me to, uh, to get the comments. <laughs> um, <laughs> so throw all the shade you want. Cool. So this is the, the demo app but we can close that out. Our application currently looks like this. It just says Poke Battle, and there's nothing on it. So let's go in and make some updates. So again, what we did earlier was we updated the underscore app.js file to just bring in Tailwind CSS, and we're just doing the, 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 the uh, distributed version so that you know we're not going to be making any changes to Tailwind. We just want its classes to be able to style our application. Um, so that's all we did on the underscore app. And then within our home component, within our index page, we are going to create the UI to either start a new game, start a new battle, or join an existing battle. And um, let's clean up some of this UI just to make it look uh, a little, little prettier and uh, to, to build out what we had in the demo. So we'll start with uh, a couple of Tailwind classes. We'll say BG Blue 100. I screen and what this is going to do is just You're give so us so much shade right now. Blue background. Yeah. No <laughs> I just panicked for a second. 
Um, and then we want our Pokemon Battle, which is the name of our app. Let's uh, let's make it really big so people know where they're at. So we'll make a, a 5XL size. We'll make it bold. And Are you using two spaces instead of four spaces for your tabs? Uh, I am, right? Two. Yeah. I, All right. And then uh, we'll add some padding. So now we have Poke Battle. And then from here, let's go ahead and create our new game and join an existing game um, sections. And they're going to be side by side. So we can use uh, Tailwind CSS's great Flexbox functionality. So we'll say class name equals flex. And we'll say tech center and space x16. And what this is going to do is it's going to give us a little bit of separation between the two containers. And then we'll have two containers, class name, that are each half of the width of the page. And one of them is going to be new game. And the other is going to be, again, it's going to be width one half, so take up half of the page. And it's going to be uh, join an existing game, right? Uh, yeah, so uh, we got a question, class or class name. I think you're using class name because it's React, right? We are using class name because it's React. And even if you use class, uh, React isn't going to break it. It's going to throw warnings in the console for you. But you can use, you know, you should be using class name. But uh, muscle memory for me is still class. So I, I'll try I think to. use class somewhere else. Um, we're getting a comment saying that. Did I? Uh, I think. Uh, right. By the way, Otto, you used class. I don't know where. I, I must have missed it. I, I just fixed Admit. it in one place. So that oh, could have right. been an earlier comment. So now we have new game, join game. They don't do anything at the moment. But uh, what we are going to do for the join a game, uh, we need to allow the user to add an input, to add you know the, the ID that they are uh, joining the game on. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll say input. Uh, and again, we'll do a class name. We'll make this one uh, with uh, one half of the page. Give it a little bit of padding. It's going to be a type text, and that should be good there. And then for joining a game, what we're going to do is redirect the user to the battle page, which doesn't exist at the moment. And we're going to append a battle ID to, to, um, to that request. And we don't have that at the moment, so we'll just save it as is. And we'll say, OK. And then let's add a couple of classes just to uh, fix up our UI. I'll be using class name. We'll say with full uh, padding of six, just to make it a more prominent button. And we'll give it a background of blue 200 and maybe a little bit of margin. I absolutely love Tailwind, but I cannot for <laughs> the life of me remember half of the, half of the stuff still. <laughs> once you, uh, I've, I've had that trouble at the beginning with Tailwind, but once you memorize like the basic like the background colors margins and paddings you're like 90 percent of the way there um so we have our right hand side with uh adding your custom string and then joining a game let's go back and fix our new game as well and i'll copy the same styles just to save time uh we're getting a comment in here that says why not use a next link uh, you could use a next link, but the reason um, I'm not is uh, when we pass in this um, query parameter, if you're using a next link, uh, it doesn't kick off uh, the the socket the, the way that you expect it. Um, and I'll cover that uh, a little bit more in depth when, when we get to it. But you could, you could use next link in, in some parts. I find it easier to just use a, a regular link uh, in this case. Um, so starting a new game, we're just going to go to the battle. We're not going to have a battle ID. And then we also need to. We got a, we got a question saying, what is your, uh, what Google Chrome theme are you using? Um, uh, were you, oh yeah, all right, there you go. I think I'm using blue. Uh, I think it's just literally <laughs> just called blue. <laughs> all right. Uh, I'll say it looks cool. Well, thank you. <clears throat> so. The last thing we need to do on, on here is get this battle ID and, and store it and send it. So when a user inputs a battle ID here, we want to capture it and append it to our uh, battle link that, that has the battle ID query parameter. And 
to do this, we're not going to be creating a really complex form or anything. We're just going to do an on change event here that is going to capture the event. And then we're going to um, we'll use React hooks. So let's say import React and use state from React. And then just to capture that battle ID and be able to use it throughout our application, let's say const uh, battle ID and then set battle ID. And this is going to use state and it's just going to be a string. So then here, what we can do is call this set battle ID function. So we'll say set battle ID and get the e target value, which is going to be whatever the input in this text box is. It's going to be set as the battle ID uh, every time it changes. And then we're just going to append it here. So let's update this guy. Also add our battle ID. So this looks good. Uh, let's save and let's go back into our application and make sure everything works so far. So if we just hit the new game button, it's just going to redirect this to the battle page, which doesn't exist at the moment. So we are going to get a 404 page not found. That's OK. And then if we click the join a game button and add a random string to it, which would be the string of our game, it's also going to redirect this to battle. And then it's going to add as a query parameter that battle ID and then whatever we added to the to the link. So, so far, we have our initial page up and running. We have our new game. We have our ability to join, join a game. The next thing we're going to do is go out and build a skeleton for our battle page. And the reason, one of the reasons I love Next.js so much is it's page-based routing. So rather than bringing in React Router and setting up routes myself, all I need to do is create a new page inside this pages directory, and we'll call it battle.js. So I want to plug something real quick. Uh, me and you, we did a Next.js, you know, like intro to Next.js uh, previously on a stream, right? Mm -hmm. Earlier in the year. So it should be floating around on YouTube. Uh, I definitely recommend that you you pull it up. It was a, it was a good stream. Yeah, check it out. Um, and then from here, we have our battle.js page. So all we need to do is create a function uh, for our component here. And I will call it battle. And it's going, let's just render or return. Uh, let's say div battle page for now, just to make sure that it works. So we have battle.js, we have our battle function. And now if we go into the new game, into the battle side of things, we see that we have our battle page. It knows how to route to it, and we are good to go. Um, before we oh, so, go ahead, Nick. No, I said sweet. Looks good. Awesome. Uh, one final thing I want to build out here before we um, before we start adding the real-time functionality is let's go ahead and use one of those API endpoints that uh, Nick had created to display our list of Pokemon on this battle page. So, so we'll build out our Pokemon selection page. Um, and the way we'll do this is let's go into the index here and let's get some of our classes um, brought in just so that we have consistent styling. And then we'll uh, create our user interface. Or actually, let's display our battle ID um, if we know that, that we have one. So we'll say class name here. Uh, we'll just make it text center. And we'll call it battle ID. So that if you are creating a new game and you want to share it out with your uh, with a friend to join your game, uh, you know what the battle ID is. And then we'll just. This is a shade that's coming your way, Otto. But we got someone saying that you look like Mark Zuckerberg today. Oh, well, uh, thank you. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. <clears throat> um, I'll take it as good, I guess. <laughs> um, so we'll have battle ID, and that's going to be um, our overall battle, but essentially that battle object that we created in our data model, um, underscore ID. And the reason that um, autocomplete is uh, kind of messing with me right now is because we don't have a battle uh, represented. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll move this and we'll say import react use state react. 
And There's a follow up to that comment. It said, uh, you look great. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Mark looks great as well. And uh, so we'll say uh, const battle. And this battle object is going to represent that battle data model that we created earlier. And uh, we'll have the function for it say set battle so that we can Looks update like Karen it. Karen just joined the party too. Hey, Karen. <laughs> um, and we're going to use state. And in this example, uh, our battle is a is a complex object. And the reason that I'm going to define the skeleton of this object is so that in our React component, when we're defining um, the visual elements of it, we can we don't have to worry about if they exist and checking if they exist. We can assume that you know at a default, some parts of it are going to exist. And what is going to exist is an ID, which by default is going to be null. Uh, player one, which is going to have a Pokemon that we don't know what the Pokemon is, as well as player two, who's also going to have a Pokemon that by default does not exist. So now we can go back in here and fix this battle ID. And we can start creating our Pokemon uh, selection. So um, first of all, to, to display our Pokemon, we're going to need to. Sorry, that was Siri. Uh, the first thing we're going to need to do is interact with Nick's backend API, uh, calling that uh, localhost 3000 Pokemon API to get the list of Pokemon. And we can do this, you know, if you're just building a React application, we can write a, you know, in a use effect, do a fetch call, get the data. But with Next.js, we can have this run server side. We can have it execute before we render the component in the first place. And I think that's a much better way to do it. So let's go ahead and do that. And to do this, what we're going to do is create another kind of protected, reserved uh, function in the Next.js ecosystem called get server side props. And what this method is going to do is when we deploy our application, it's going to run first. It's never going to be sent to the client. It's going to be executed server side. It's going to execute whatever code we put into it, and then it's going to pass props into our React component. So to show you how this works, we'll say const response, and then we're going to make a fetch request, and it's going to be a uh, async await. So we'll say fetch HTTP localhost 3000 Pokemon. And this API endpoint is the one that Nick had created earlier. And then we're going to get that data so we'll say response.json. We just want the body of it. And again, this is a promise. So we're going to wait on it. And then this is kind of um, an ugly thing that if you're using get server side props, you need to do at the moment. Um, by default, when we're passing in props from one component to the other, they can only be plain JavaScript objects. And if they're not, uh, it's going to complain. So the way to get around this is. We'll say const Pokemon for our data object. And we're just going to um, stringify and parse our data that we get back. And this is going to turn it into uh, a JSON string and then a JSON object. And then we'll be able to work with that object. And then finally, we're going to return our props, which are going to be Pokemon in this case. So. This is our get server side props function that's going to run every time we load the battle page. We're going to get our list of Pokemon and pass it as a prop to our React component up here. So let's capture this and we'll restructure it here to get our list of Pokemon. So far, so good. Now we can go and display those Pokemon for our two players. And to do this, what we're going to do is and bear with me, I'll, I'll try to code as quickly as possible. So let's no, say no, this. No hurry, man. We've got time. <laughs> we don't want to make it so fast that people can't follow. OK, well, um, yeah, let me know. Uh, let me know if the pace is good, if it's too slow, too, too slow, too fast. Or if you have any questions, I'm happy to take as much time as we need. But what we'll you're gonna, say. You're going to get some wild responses out of that one. Everyone's, <laughs> everyone's got their own different standard for uh, pace, I think. Auto and X center. Now we're creating our container object for uh, our two Pokemon. And then we're going to, again, since we have two players, we're going to create a flex box and give it 
a little space, let's say 24 here, uh, for the two components that are going to be side by side. Uh, from here, we'll say div class name, and I forgot to add class name here, with one half of the page. So this is going to be player one. Let's say player one. And then we'll do a similar thing for player two. Let's go uh, back. And we, we have Karen asking a question here. <laughs> Will server-side props help me with all my await async timing issues in the fetching of data in use effect? Absolutely, Karen. Yeah, if, if you use get server-side props, you don't have to worry about fetching that data again in your React component, so you don't have to worry about using it in use effect, which I know can get so complicated so quickly, and it's just like a, a mental, mental like, <laughs> not a good time. Um, so we have our player one, player two sections. They look good so far. The next thing we're going to do is load in our Pokemon. So we'll say, um, if the Pokemon object exists, then we're going to map. And then here, we can't use Pokemon again. So let's say something like uh, monster, or let's say mon, because I don't think they're monsters, personally. <coughs> From here, they're pocket so we're, monsters. They're pocket monsters. Um, so with this, what we're going to do is we're going to check to see if we got our data, if we have a list of Pokemon. And if we do, we're going to map over those Pokemon, taking each one individually and rendering them to the page. And from here, what we're going to do is... Otto, did you add a, a JSON parse and a JSON stringify? Uh, we have a, a question around it, I think. Um, I did. Says, uh, uh, why are we using um, JSON parse and JSON string if I like that? Uh, so this is a limitation of the get server side props method uh, in Next.js, where you're not allowed to pass complex JavaScript objects to um, to the React component. It just has to be a plain JavaScript object, and if you have complex data types, it it just kind of craps out. So we stringify it to convert it to convert the whole object to a string and then parse it back, which removes all of those complexities. Um, hopefully, you know, the, the next JS team and, you know, we'll, we'll work with them to, to kind of address this and make it better in the future, but it's kind of a hacky solution, but, but it does work. <clears throat> um, anyway, getting back into yeah, here, no I will say monster and then we'll display their ID as a unique key so React doesn't yell at us. Um, keep the keep the questions coming in the chat. By the way, I am uh, while while Otto is typing, I am uh, moderating. Well, not I guess necessarily moderating. I'm I'm pulling in questions for us here. I'm using the MongoDB handle. Right on. Uh, and then we'll say h2 last name text bold or no, it's font bold text. Let's say Excel, and we'll say the monster's name. So let's see if this works. So we have our Pokemon. If we have our Pokemon, we're going to map over our Pokemon, and then we're going to display the Pokemon's image as well as uh, their name. So if we go back into our application, refresh, here we go. So we got our Bulbasaur, Charmander, Squirtle, Pikachu, all of the ones we had earlier. But uh, they are way too big for this. So let's go back and yeah, add. Then your random random mud mudkip in there. <laughs> <laughs> add a couple of classes of, we'll say, oh, I know what I want to do. So instead of trying to mess with this, we'll actually do more flexbox. So let's say our Pokemon are going to be um, wrapped in a flex container. So we'll have flex, flex wrap, so that they are too big. We can um, show them on the second page. And then we are going to have our Pokemon take up, let's say, a fourth of the page. Now if we go back, it looks much, much better. We have our Pokemon. They take up the full size of the container, and they don't grow bigger than that. And so we have our, our eight Pokemon. We have, we have another question coming in from Karen. Uh, if we're basic JSON, would you have to do it? No. Uh, you need you need to do this. All right. Right. So so if it was just basic JSON that, that you had in there that you were getting back from MongoDB, you wouldn't have to do the the parse and stringify. <clears throat> um, so we have our Pokemon for player one. 
Um, for player two, it's going to look exactly the same. So I'm just going to copy and paste underneath here. Boom. There you go. Nice. So we have our battle page and our home page, which allows you to start a battle, create it. I think we have, you know, our UI is looking pretty good. And at the moment, there's no functionality. So you can't select any of the Pokemon. You can't have them fight yet. So what do you say, Nick? We go back and start adding some of the Sakadayo in real time change team functionality so that we can capture these events as, um, as they're being made. Yeah, sure. Uh, you want to switch it over to my screen again? Yep. Here we go. Boom. All right. Let's get back into it for the back end. Um, all right. So where do we leave off? We left off with the endpoints, right? Now we want to do some socket IO stuff, uh, which is actually, in my opinion, really cool. Um, I, don't, I don't know how you feel, Otto. Socket IO is, is game changing. And uh, yeah, if you're not familiar is. with socket IO, um, it's basically. Uh, Making it's basically real time communication for uh, Node.js and and basically JavaScript based applications. So um, what this is going to allow us to do is when you join a battle, you know whether you join from the same browser or a different browser or across the world, as long as you have the same battle ID, you're going to be in real time communication with the other person. So you'll be able to pick different Pokemon. I'll see like if Nick and I play. Nick is in California. I'm in Las Vegas. So you know, when he selects a Pokemon, I'll see his change right away. I'll select the Pokemon, he'll see my change right away. And then when we duke it out in the in the fight stage, all of that is going to be real time. So as I think it's really, really cool. And uh, well, sort of actually, um, the way that we've, we're doing it is going to be a little different. Um, and some might argue that uh, it's a little against the grain. Um, but we're gonna be using change streams for this rather than direct communication between uh, our messages, right? Right. And uh, we talked about this uh, when we were planning this demo. We were thinking, like, does it make sense to even use chain streams if you can use socket IO? And I think it does. And yeah. the reason it does is with chain streams, we're going to be able to kind of centralize all of our update operations in one go instead of having to worry about creating a bunch of different socket IO emitters and uh, you know socket connections. We could just have one central. Uh, one central function that, that's going to handle all of it. And uh, you'll see when we start coding it out. So why don't we jump in oh, yeah. and um, show the all coolness right. of Socket.io. Yeah. So we have Socket.io. It's defined by IO. Um, so we're going to start using that. Uh, so I'm going to say io.on. And Socket.io has, it's, it's, it's for messaging. So it, it has a set of predefined uh, messages that it's going to expect. So for example, like a connection. Um, is I think uh, one of the predefined. There are a few others. I don't, I don't know all of them. Maybe Otto, do you know um, any of the the keyword kind of ones? Uh, not off the top of my head. Yeah, there's a few I think, uh, but connection is one. So this is when our front end connects to our uh, back end through a socket connection. So when this when uh, I guess the handshake happens. Uh, so we're gonna get the the, the socket uh, that was connected. And uh, in it, let's just go ahead and start by saying uh, maybe console.log. We can say a client has connected. And we don't have any kind of auth for this example. We're, we're allowing everyone in. Uh, but anytime a con uh, connection is made, uh, we're going to print out this message. Um, and then what happens, uh, what we're going to look for is we're going to look for any kind of messages coming from this socket. So. Uh, maybe the socket sends a, a, an attack, or maybe the socket sends a, a message saying they want to join a particular battle, or so on and so forth. Uh, we're going to be referencing this particular socket variable, because the connection itself, it doesn't mean that they've joined a battle. It just means that they've connected to our socket server. Um, so we're going to get to all of that. Uh, let's start with actually joining a battle. How's that sound, Otto? Let's do it, yeah. <clears throat> so we're going to use socket. Um, so that's the socket that's that's communicating with us, um, and we're gonna listen for the join. So this is something that uh, we're gonna we're gonna define on the the client end, um, and this is gonna be asynchronous because we are gonna be working with our database. So there's gonna be a delay there, um, but we're gonna say async rather than working with the promise directly, um, and we're going to accept with this join a uh, battle ID or a room ID or whatever you want to call it. Um, this battle ID is going to tell us, you know what, 
we care about this particular battle only, not all of the other battles that might be uh, connected to the server as well. Uh, so I'm going to say battle ID. And inside of it, uh, let's go ahead and uh, maybe do a do a query here. So uh, first of all, since we're using async, I'm going to say try. And I'm going to catch. And if there was any kind of error, we're just going to print it out. Uh, if there wasn't, uh, then what we can do is uh, let's find see if that battle ID exists. We're going to use the, the join and kind of create in the same um, socket um, event listener. Right. Uh, so what, what do we want to say? Let, not var, let uh, result. I'm not going to forget about that one for this whole stream. <laughs> that, sound, that sounds like an Adrian comment. Did Adrian make that comment? <laughs> uh, I don't think she made it, but she was definitely pile on, piling on afterwards. <laughs> Because yeah, I, I I give her a lot of uh, I I hit back on all the C sharp stuff, so she's probably getting me back. Uh, so await collections dot. Uh, let's, this is for battles, so we want to join a particular battle, uh, and we want to find one. Uh, so rather than just doing uh, an empty bracket there, uh, we're actually going to provide a filter. We're going to, we're going to provide the ID. We know that the ID is a string that's randomly generated. Um, and it's also passed in, uh, with, with this particular join message. Um, so we're going to find one. We don't need to say two array because we're, it's not going to be an array. It's going to be a single object. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can check to see if uh, result is null. If it's, if it's null, uh, well, I mean, if it's not null, um, because I've just left it like that, it means that that battle exists. Let's go ahead and return it. So I'm going to say socket.emit. So it's going to emit it uh, back to uh, any 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 uh, socket that's that's going to be in this in this uh, well this particular socket I should say it's going to return it back to this particular socket that that joined. Uh, so I'm going to say um, I don't know for now I'm just going to say message. We're going to change that later, um, and it's going to be a result. So we're going to change it later. Uh, for now, it's just going to be message. But the, the concept here is we're returning uh, our uh, our battle object back to the user. If it does not exist, so our, our result came back null. We're going to do else. Um, so else, we're going to say that we want to create a new battle. So we're going to say new battle. And we're going to say await. And we're going to say collections.battles. Uh, insert one. So this is going to be very similar to what we saw inside of our battle playground, where we're going to insert a document. It's not going to be as complete because at the time of join, if we're creating a new a new battle, we won't have selected our Pokemon yet. Uh, but at least uh, we can create that initial document with ID. Uh, so insert one. And what we want to say is we want to provide it an ID, which we already know. It's battle ID. We want to provide it a player one. And this is where it's going to be kind of empty uh, because we, don't, we haven't selected our Pokemon yet. We don't know what, what, what we want to use. Um, so we're going to say player one, and this is going to be Pokemon, and it's just going to be an empty object, just kind of a placeholder for us. Right, and, likewise, and it's also going to... Um match what we have in the in the react component for when you first join a game um essentially just being a blank slate and just stubbed out where the pokemon will live yeah exactly uh, so we have uh, this new document that was inserted um and in this case what we're going to say is we're going to say socket dot um and we're going to say uh, in this case i'm still going to call it message for now and we're going to change it later uh, but I'm going to say new battle, and I am going to say ops zero. Um, and I could have easily said, uh, just like if I had pulled this out into a separate object, I could have, or a separate variable, I could have just returned that instead. Right, Otto? Right, right. and that is dot ops zero is what gets sent back uh, once you run an insert one operation. Uh, what you get back is an acknowledgement. So that new battle is the acknowledgement that a document was created in the database. And if you want to see that full document, you have to go into the ops package and it's an array of things that might have been inserted. And at array zero, it's going to be, uh, or at index zero, it's going to be that document that we inserted. Yep. 
Exactly. So in the event, uh, so whether or not we find a, a battle going on, we either join it or we create it, but emitting the actual battle information, that's not good enough for us. Uh, what we have to do is we actually have to tell our socket to join a particular, I think socket IO calls them rooms because if you're thinking like a chat room, but we're going to be referring to ours as a, a battle room, I guess you can say. Uh, so we're actually going to say uh, socket.join, and our room is going to be the battle ID. So that way when we send messages around with that battle ID, it's only going to send them to people who are connected to that ID, not just everyone connected to our server. Mm -hmm. so we're going to join it, um, and then we're going to say socket. We can say maybe active room, um, so that way it just stores a variable for us to use for future um, because it, we can't easily get the rooms that you're joined to in Socket.io. We're just going to store it manually. We're going to say battle ID. Uh, I th think that's a good join. Uh, we will, like I said, change message. So uh, we're going to recycle some of our code, and that's going to have to do with our change stream, and that's when, that's when I'll change it. Uh, should, I, should I keep going, Otto, or should we see what this join looks like? Um... No, let, let's see what the join looks like. Uh, I think that'll be a, a good next step. So um, I'll take yeah, over. Switch we'll, your screen. We'll go back to the front end and let's add the functionality. Because right now, when you go to battle or if you even go to, to the home page and add an ID and join a game, it's all oh, static. I, just, I, was gonna say, I just saw this chat message from Adrian and we missed a total opportunity. Instead of calling it a battle ID, it's a gym. <laughs> super awesome. Oh, I like that. Next time. <laughs> yeah. Um, but right now, whenever you load up the battle page, it's pretty static. There's no dynamic functionality on it whatsoever. So let's go ahead and change that so that when you do join uh, a battle, when you do hit this page, you either get a new battle created and stored in the in the back end with Socket.io or you join an existing one that, that's already there. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to go into Visual Studio Code, and we're going to bring in a couple of different libraries that are going to help us work um, with Socket.io in our application. So uh, let me open up the terminal here. I'll open up a new bash window. And let's uh, import or npm install a Socket IO client. So we're going to need uh, the Socket IO client for our web browser. And then we are also going to install um, npm install random string, which is just a um, npm package. It's going to allow us to generate a random string for our battle IDs. And we could have done this with MongoDB generating a unique object ID, but just to show that you know you don't have to use MongoDB for everything, we'll just you know use a random string. So with these two libraries installed, I think we're good to go. So I'm going to go ahead and import the Socket.io client, uh, client Pixie from our Socket.io client package. And then I'm also going to import random string from the random string package. And then here, um, now that we're getting into some, some real functionality, we're also going to bring in use effect because we're going to want an effect to kick off once we load the page once. So that is our setup. We're looking good so far. Um, the next thing we're going to do is establish a connection to our um, to the socket uh, to the socket IO server to, to the WebSocket server that Nick has created. And the way we're going to do this is I'll just do it outside of the function, and we'll say const socket uses the socket IO client. And then we pass in the URL where the connection is running to localhost 3000. And then we're also, we don't want to connect to it automatically when the page loads. Well, we want to control when that happens. So we'll say auto connect false. And then from here, we're going to go into our battle component and we're going to create our use effect call. So let's say use effect and we'll have the function that executes. And we only want this to run once initially. So we're going to keep the empty array. Then from here, the first thing we're going to do is connect to our socket IO connection. So once the component is loaded, 
Once our React works, we're going to connect to the socket. And then we are going to um, run socket.on. So on our connection, once we've uh, successfully established a connection to our server, we're going to uh, run an async function, which is going to um, create uh, either create or join our battle. So what we're going to do is we're going to run a socket.emit. So what this is going to do is it's going to emit a message back to our socket server that says uh, join. So the endpoint, uh, the, the socket endpoint that make it created called join. And what we're going to pass in is either a battle ID or if we don't have a battle ID, um, we're going to do one of these fancy conditionals. So if we have a battle ID already defined, we're going to pass it in. If we don't, we're going to use our random string library to generate a random battle ID. Now, where is this battle ID coming from? Um, we said that we were going to allow a user to add a you know list of characters here, hit join, and it's going to be appended to the query string here. And to access this query string, again, we can use the get server side props method to work with this and pass it as a prop to our um, to our component. I think this is much easier than uh, trying to capture the, the query string from React. And the way we can access this is we'll get the query uh, in the get server side props before the before anything even happens to the component. And then uh, we're going to just pass it as a prop. And I'll say battle ID is going to be um, query.battle ID. So if we have one, it's going to be the battle ID. If not, it's just going to be null. We'll go back into our component here. And then in addition to Pokemon, we'll also get a potential battle ID. So, so far, so good. Now, when we go into our application and refresh, there's really no change on the backend, or there's no change to the to the UI. But if we look at our terminal that has the um, WebSocket server running, that has the Socket.io server running, when we refresh, we get the message that a new client has connected, meaning that we are calling the the socket correctly. Yep. Um, so we have that. So, so now we're able to join a connect. We're able to join a um, a battle. Um, I think the next step would be, you know, let's let's work on the uh, selection process, and so allowing the user to player one and player two to select their Pokemon. And I think Nick, what we can do is build out the UI for it, build out the interactions, yeah, let's do it. and then go back and uh, connect it via socket. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so what we're going to do is we need to add some functionality to our uh, React uh, to our Next.js front end so that when you click on one of the Pokemon, uh, they are highlighted and that gets emitted to the, to the back end. So let's go into our code here into the uh, Pokemon selection class and we'll just work with player one for now. Um, what we're going to do first is allow an on-click event. So if you click the entire kind of div box that controls um, that controls the, the Pokemon with, the, with their name and picture, we are going to... Um, we have a comment coming in the chat. We're getting a request for you to click the hide button on your stop sharing little widget there at the bottom of the screen. <laughs> oh. There, there we go. go. I didn't even know that was showing up. <laughs> I think they're just they're just trolling you. Yeah, no worries. Um, so on click, what we're gonna do is socket dot emit, and what we're gonna emit is a uh, message saying select, and a one for player one, uh, or a one, and then the Pokemon that the player one has selected. So if you click on that, we don't have this. Um, socket created on the back end. So right now it's not going to do anything. But once we do have it, when you select a Pokemon, it's going to be passed back to the back end. And um, I think what else, we, the other thing we need to do is give the user some type of indication, indicator that 
they've selected a Pokemon and which one they've selected. So let's go ahead and update the class name here to include just a lot of space here. I could use uh, string literals, but yeah. Uh, what we'll say is um, if battle dot player one Pokemon dot ID equals 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 monster ID. Uh, oh, this. Then we're going to set the background to green, green 200. And otherwise, we're not gonna, we're gonna leave the class as empty. Uh, so essentially what this is gonna do is when you select a Pokemon, the battle object is gonna be updated with that Pokemon's name. And if that ID matches, it's gonna highlight their background as being slightly green. And uh, we can do the same thing here. I'll copy both the class name and the onclick event for player two. So we're just gonna update all of this. And here, instead of player one, we're gonna say player two. And then here, instead of player one, it's gonna be player two. And we are good to go. But now, again, since um, we're using the socket IO, but since we're emitting the select option, right now when you click on it, nothing is going to happen uh, just due to the fact that uh, we're not listening for that specific emitter on the back end. And it looks like I might have broken something. Uh, uh, oh, class versus class name. That always gets Wait, me. That, will that actually cause, I thought it's just a warning though. It's an actual error. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, see uh, I don't see it can you do a search for class equals I think what's happening is or maybe oh that whole class doesn't exist yeah one of those so this guy should be added but he's not it's okay I could fix that let's um let's work on adding this uh, socket for select. And um, while, while you do that, I'll fix my little typo that, that I have somewhere here just so we don't um, waste time with people. This is just a, a UI issue, so it's nothing uh, nothing major. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'll find out you what's- can switch over to me. I'll start doing another socket uh, listener. I think I figured it out. Uh, uh, yep. I'm getting a, a, a comment coming in saying, before we switch over to the back end again, can we have a quick rundown flow-wise for the socket server client communication? I think it's worthwhile. What do you yes. think? Yep, and so I fixed that issue. I was just forgetting the parentheses around here. Uh, so essentially on the front end, what happens is um, when a user hits the battle page, we connect to the socket server, right? So the, the socket server runs on localhost 3000. Uh, when our component is loaded, we connect to that socket server, and then on a successful connection, we are going to join a battle. And with this join, if you recall from, from Nick's implementation, it takes in one parameter, which is a battle ID. So if we do have a battle ID, we're gonna pass it in. If not, we're going to generate a random string that's gonna be our battle ID. Um, and then the other communication we have with sockets at the moment is uh, this, emitter for a select operation, meaning that when you click on one of the Pokemon, it's going to send a, it's going to emit a message with the player's name or the player's number, player one or two, and which whichever Pokemon they chose. And depending on which one they chose, it's going to highlight once we have the uh, select socket implemented. And then I'll turn it over to you, Nick, to, to talk about the backend logic. Yeah, and if, ahead and switch it over to my screen. And if that doesn't make sense, please, uh, please let us know and we can uh, elaborate further. Oh, you got my screen? Yes. All right, perfect. All right, so what we want to do is we want to do the select. Um, so that way we can emit uh, and actually change inside of our battle document which which player was selected uh, or which Pokemon was selected for a particular player. So uh, I created uh, uh, socket.onjoin. I'm just going to go ahead and create another one in here. Um, so this this is within the, the, the main connection right there. 
Uh, so what I'm going to say is I'm going to say uh, socket dot on. I'm just out of the corner of my eye. I'm paying uh, loosely attention to the chat. Um, every every once in a while, I see it come through. Um, but select and uh, what are we passing? We're passing the player information you said auto as well as the Pokemon they selected. Correct. So the first argument that I'm passing into you is the player number, and then the second argument is the Pokemon itself. Got it. Um, and because we're going to be working with our database again, this should be async. Um, and because of that, we're going to we're going to do our our same old try and catch here. And if uh, we don't experience any kind of errors, uh, let's go ahead and do an if statement to see what our player number is that comes through either a one or a two. Uh, so we're gonna say if player equals uh, one, then what we can do is uh, say, oh, I'll do the else in just a second, but let's do an await. And let's say collections.battles dot update one. So we're going to update one particular battle. Um, and uh, for that one update, it's going to take uh, a few few conditions here, or a few parameters. So the first parameter is going to be the filter uh, criteria, or the match criteria, and then the, the second one is going to be uh, what we're doing as far as an update goes. Um, so the first one, we're going to filter based on the ID, and the ID is going to be socket.active room. So this is this is the room that the the connected socket is a part of, uh, which we set inside of the join. Um, so that's going to be our, our ID. That's going to be our only parameter, since we only ever have one document per per battle. Uh, so now we need to worry about what happens. What do we want to change inside of that document that was matched, if at all? Um, so I can say set. So I'm going to set a particular field. There are multiple fields. Um, and I'm going to say that I want to set the player one uh, field within our document. And within the player one, I want to say that I want to set uh, Pokemon. Uh, so Pokemon is going to be equal to exactly as it came in, Pokemon. Um, so uh, provided that this is player one, we're just updating our battle document to include the Pokemon information. Um, and in this scenario, we are... I think, uh, and Otto, you can correct me if I'm wrong, we're pretty heavily reliant on the trust factor that our client is sending us. Um, correct. Data, he, right? <laughs> yeah, we're not, uh, you know, in a real world application, you probably want to yeah. do some logic to check and make sure that that Pokemon is what you'd expect as well as the player number. But just for, you know, demo purposes and for making the code clear so that you can understand what's yeah. going on, we're just going to keep it simple and have implicit trust. Yeah, for sure. All right, so else, something else other than player one, hopefully player two, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but we're going to, uh, let's go ahead and copy this. Save us some typing there. And instead of updating player one, this is gonna be player two. And I realize that we can uh, we can write better code, but uh, I'm not, I'm not looking to write the most efficient code here. I'm just trying to keep it clear and easy to understand, like Otto said. Um, so that's why I just duplicated it. Yep. Um, if that's good, I are we expecting a response from this one? Uh, we are not expecting a response here, but I think this is where our change streams come in. Um, yeah. Where right. we where what we want to do. So at this point, what we could do is, you know, captured information. Um, that was updated and send it back via sockets. But then we would have to do this for every single socket that, that we created, all of the additional emitters that, that we want. But uh, with MongoDB change streams, I think we can kind of simplify that all in one location. So, so I think that would be a good next step to kind of show how this works. Yeah, let's do that. So to actually get started with um, change streams, we actually need to watch a, for particular changes. And we could watch uh, changes on a document level, on a collection level, on a database level. We're gonna watch for changes uh, in, a, in a particular collection. Um, and uh, we're also going to watch based on certain criteria. So that way, if, uh, if say for example, something changed and it's not something we care about, eh, we're, gonna, we're gonna ignore it. 
Um, and we could do all of that inside of the listen. So that's where we're going to initialize it, uh, the actual watch, and then we're going to uh, respond to any events that have happened uh, based on that watch uh, elsewhere. Um, so after we've got our, our handle to the collections, I can say something like, um, and what I want to do, because I plan to use it inside of the, so the socket area, I need to create another variable. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say let, and I'm going to say maybe change battles, or like change stream battles. Uh, so that way we can use it elsewhere. Uh, but I'm going to say change battles, and I'm going to say equals collections dot battles dot watch. And this is, it accepts an aggregation pipeline. Um, so this is a MongoDB aggregation pipeline that it accepts. Uh, we're only going to have a single stage for this pipeline. It's going to be very basic. But we're going to be looking uh, for a match. And what we're actually going to be looking for is we want to see what the operation type is. Um, so rather than watching for if a document was created or deleted, things like that, we want to we want to watch to make sure uh, the document was updated. And those are the things that we care about. Um, so what we can say is operation type, and we want to say update. So now, now we're only going to get uh, change events uh, in our in our application if if a document was updated inside of this battle collection. Uh, but there's more to it. So if we just did this and we we looked for update, it, it, an update came in, it would tell us what exactly was updated in that change stream. For this example, it's probably valuable to include the entire document, not just the delta, uh, because when when the document changes for any reason, we want to send it back to the client, everything. Um, so for that, we actually need to add uh, an option to the watch. What we want to say is we want to say uh, full document, and we want to say um, update lookup. And now what that's going to do is it's going to provide us the entire document every time uh, an update happens. Um, and it's totally up to you if that's what you need. If you don't need the entire document um, in your change stream, then don't don't include it. Uh, but for us, we will. How's that sound, Otto? That sounds perfect. Yeah, I think that's since our document is fairly simple. Uh, you know, I think getting the whole thing makes sense. But yeah. you know, if you were working with a document that had you know, thousands of fields, I think at that point you might want to reconsider and, you know, approach it differently. But for our purposes, just getting the whole document back on an update operation makes sense. Yeah. All right. So that's the watch. Now we actually need to respond uh, to kind of what, what comes in. And we want to do that inside of the socket because when a change comes in, we want to be able to send it to the appropriate sockets that are connected. Um, it doesn't really matter where you put it inside of, of this connection. I'm going to put it at the top, just, uh, for the flow purposes. Uh, but what I'm gonna say is I'm gonna say change battles and I'm gonna say on change. So anytime a change comes in, uh, we're going to be able to do something with it. And in our case, we're gonna send that change to our connected sockets. Uh, so we're gonna say io.2, and this is where it's valuable uh, for the active room. So that way we don't send it to every single socket that's possibly connected to our application only the ones for this particular room, or as Adrian said, a gym. Um, but we're going to say socket.activeroom. And we're going to emit. And what we're going to emit is, uh, first of all, we need uh, what, what, what we want to call the emission. Um, and this is where we might want to change it from message to something else. Um, in my mind, I, th I think of it as kind of like a refresh. We're refreshing our data on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we call it refresh. OK. That makes sense. It, it doesn't have to be that. It could be really whatever whatever you want it to be. Um, but we're going to say next dot full document. So when we see a change, we're going to send that entire document to the socket. Um, so not bad. Now, since we call the refresh here, we might want to change it down here as well. So we're going to say refresh. And I think I have it down here as well uh, for refresh. Because in all of these scenarios, uh, we're not really sending a, a message. Uh, we're, we're sending just a notice to the user that we have a refreshed data set. And that data is going to be the same in all of these circumstances. Um, not not the exact data, but the type of data that comes back. Right. That, that makes sense. Um, 
Yes, and it looks like you know in all of the both the, the joint refresh state and the uh, change event refresh, we are getting back the same exact data set, the same exact yeah. data model. So I think we should be good to go now. Did we want to uh, look at the front end again before we uh, do the attack logic? I think right. Uh, yeah, well, let's uh, let's implement this refresh um, emitter. Let's capture that event on the front end and show. Yeah. Now we should be able to select Pokemon and join our room, and it should all work. So I'm going to switch back to my screen and implement that logic. So we are back at on the, our Next.js front end. And what we're going to do is in our code, in the use effect, <coughs> What we're gonna do is we're gonna run and we're gonna capture that uh, socket uh, refresh action. So what we're gonna say is socket dot on. So when a, when we get a refresh emitted from the backend, we are going to capture it and we're gonna capture the object that comes with it, which is going to be the battle, essentially the, the battle data model. And once we have that, what we're gonna do is simply just update run set battle and pass in our battle um, battle data model. And this set battle method, this is the set battle from our use state. So it's gonna update the battle object throughout the rest of our application and everything should, um, should work for, from then on. So now we should be able to select our Pokemon on both, um, on both of the players and see which ones are selected because we have these uh, select emitters. So let's see if that works. I'm going to go back and refresh my page. And it, as you can see, it's already updated because we have this battle ID of ASD, 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 ASD properly reflected. And then the Pokemon that we select is highlighted in this kind of light, light green background. And that works for both player one and player two. And all this is made possible with chain streams and socket IO giving us real-time communication. Proof, so if I were- Proof auto, can you open up another browser? Yes. Just to show so, because it's one thing, it, we're in the same browser here. It's the same socket connection, right? Yep. So here we go. Our, our app isn't very mobile friendly, but let's say for player <laughs> one, I have a private incognito browser and then a regular session. And you know we have Squirtle selected in browser one. So if we go and select Bulbasaur, Actually, let's do it the other way around. <laughs> if I select yeah. Eevee, it gets automatically yeah, updated go. or Mudkip or Pikachu. So now we have real-time communication between our two servers working. Um, so we are we are making really good progress. I think uh, I think the next stage would be to implement our um, fight capability. <clears throat> yeah. Right. So so you know you have your Pokemon selected. Player one has their Pokemon. Player two has their Pokemon. They are good to fight. Um, before though, before we get to that, I do want to show that if we were to jump into a new battle without a battle ID, that neither of the Pokemon would be selected and we'd get a custom battle ID that, that's randomly generated. So let's just test that and make sure that that works. And it does, we get a random string and by default, neither of the Pokemon are selected. Sweet. And then every time we refresh, we're gonna get a different string, which is also gonna be created in, um, in our back end as well. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and look at our logic for our fight capability. So right now we have the capability to display, um, to select our Pokemon. And I think what I wanna do just for clarity is clean up some of this code and export it to its own component just because right now, like it's getting a little harder, hard to follow along what's going on. So let's go down here and let's just create a new component called const select stage, which is going to take in our battle and Pokemon as props. And it's just going to return this stuff here. So we'll go oh, uh, down here. So to this container, so we can delete all of this. We actually don't in. have a lot left, do we? No, we are we are almost there. Uh, so that's the select stage, and then we'll just load it in here. 
So let's just add a comment saying, select Pokemon stage. And that's just going to be our select stage component. Did I call it the right thing? Uh, did I do something funky here? Um, is it because it's underlining on you? Oh, yep, fixed it. Oh, you got it. And then we will we'll want to pass in our battle from the main component as well as our Pokemon to it. So if we refresh our page, nothing has changed. It all works great. Next, we'll want to create a stage for our battle. So we'll say battle stage. Here we'll have a component called battle stage that's also going to take in battle and Pokemon. And this component doesn't exist yet. We're going to create it in just a second. So let's go collapse this guy. We can actually copy it and we'll say battle stage. And for our battle stage, it's going to look fairly similar, right? So, so one of the things we can add is um, an H1 saying fight, and let's make that uh, X, 5XL, font bold. Mm. I, I guess that's fine for now. Um, and then in here, what we're going to want to do for the battle stage is show just our Pokemon and their moveset. So to show this, we're going to do our underneath player one. We're going to load up our image. Let's style it a little bit, make it a pretty big Pokemon, and center it. It's going to have the source of battle.player1.pokemon image. And then we can also show. A, the Pokemon's name. So we'll say class name equals text to Excel font bold. And just for time's sake, just going to copy and paste the Pokemon name. And then we also want to show their uh, HP and uh, PP. So I'll just copy and paste here. We'll say Pokemon HP PP. And then if we have the Pokemon, we're going to map over their move list. So we'll say Pokemon dot moves. And we are going to have the Pokemon, so we don't need this one. <laughs> so we have our Pokemon image, the name, their health and power, and then their list of moves. So we'll say battle player one Pokemon moves dot map. And then we can call this a move. We'll say move dot name is going to be the unique ID. Um, and we don't need a class for it. We'll just assume that once you click, you are emitting an attack. And the attack is going to be which player is attacking and with what move they're attacking with. And then for our information about the moves, we are just going to, there's no image for the move. We are just going to have the move name as well as the move.pp or power cost. So that looks good. Let me save and uh -oh. something broke. That's OK. Battle. Did it say moves was undefined? It said moves was undefined. Pokemon moves. That's OK. Let's. Uh... Is it a race condition? Do you need to add a, a question mark? Um, maybe the data wasn't isn't available yet. Let's take a look.
Okay, good. So, oh, so we don't have a Pokemon selected, that's why. So if we have a Pokemon, uh-oh, we are, one is undefined. Oh, uh, key, ah, move that name. Okay, there we go. So we have our Pokemon, we have their health, their power, and then their list of moves. Let's also just clean that up a little bit. Um, and the way that we'll clean this up is we'll say each move is a width of full and each move is a column instead of a row. Uh, width full, a lot of bit of padding and margin. Let's just make the background a darker blue color. So now, now we have our Pokemon and we have their list of moves that you can select. And let's repeat the same flow for our player two. So we'll go down to here and we can remove this. And it's just gonna be a matter of replacing player one with player two. And again, this might not be the most optimized or hyper-optimized way to do things, but we are gonna do it just to make it easier to, to kind of follow along. So with that said, we have our two Pokemon and we have their moves. The last thing we need is to go in here. And so we have the emitter, attack for player two. Now, the other thing I wanna add is some logic so that right now, like when you start a new battle, uh, you have your selection of Pokemon and then you have the fight screen displayed, but you could still change your Pokemon in the middle of the game. So let's update the UI so that if both players have already chosen a Pokemon, we hide the selection screen and just show the fight screen. So to do that, we're gonna go into our code and in the select stage, we're going to add a condition that's essentially going to check and see if battle.player1.pokemon has an ID or, or doesn't have an ID. Battleplayer2.pokemon doesn't have an ID. So if either player doesn't have a Pokemon selected, meaning they're not gonna have an, an ID for that Pokemon, then we are going to display the selected stage. Otherwise, we're gonna hide that component completely. And then for the battle stage, we're only gonna wanna show it if, this, if the inverse of this is true. So if a player one has a Pokemon ID and player two, has a Pokemon ID. In that case, we're gonna say, okay, you know, show, show the battle stage. Uh, <clears throat> so with that said, now let's go ahead and test this. So we'll start up a new battle, but we don't have a battle ID. I'll pick Pikachu and I'll pick Bulbasaur. And now we move into the fight stage where our Pokemon can fight. And all of that works great. So let's go ahead and implement that functionality and show you how that actually works on, on the back end. So Nick, I, I will turn it back over to you. Sorry, I was getting questions about the suit in the chat. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're gonna add uh, the attack now, right? Mm -hmm. All right. All right, all right. Uh, let's see where, where do we, let's go ahead and add it below the select. How about to that? To be fair, I have a Pokemon shirt on. Uh, I, <laughs> we can't all be as great as Nick. <laughs> so, so there's a, there's a, uh, for the 25th anniversary Pokemon, there's a Levi's denim suit that you can buy, like Levi's denim pants and jacket, all Pokemon kind of like this, but it's just sold out. I can't get one. So maybe, maybe I'll get lucky by the end of the year. That's, that's <laughs> a whole different level right there to wear a denim suit. <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and see. Uh, so we have socket.on. 
uh, were you ex you were expecting it to be called attack, right? Uh, we are expecting it to be called attack, correct? Yeah. Um, so this is going to be asynchronous like the rest. Um, we were expecting uh, the player, so that was going to be just a numeric value, right? Mm -hmm. And the actual move, which yep. is a string, correct? Correct. All right, perfect. So this this is going to be not not too much more difficult than the previous uh, update that we did. It's just going to be a different operator, uh, but because it's asynchronous, let's go ahead and say try. Let's go ahead and say catch, uh, and then this is kind of the same same song that we've been singing the whole the whole time here on uh, setup here. So it's that's the convenience of it. It's not it's not too bad anything that we're doing. Uh, so. Uh, first of all, what we're going to try to do is we're going to see what, what the player was so we can see who's attacking. So we're going to say if player equals one, then we should probably uh, decrease player one's power points and uh, decrease player two's health points, so HP. Um, so let's do our update, kind of like what we did before. We're going to say collections.battles.update1. I'll, I'll actually bring it down to two lines so that way it's a little easier to read. Oops. Visual Studio Code does go haywire on me every once in a while as far as trying to autocomplete things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the first one is the match criteria. So the match, uh, we're going to match on the ID again since we do know it and it is unique. Um, and that is stored in the active room. Um, so we're going we're gonna to match on that. If there was a match, uh, instead of using set, where we set a field um, in the like in the previous um, when we selected, we're actually going to use the increment operator. So uh, we're going to use increment for both. Uh, we could technically increase and decrease using it depending on if we provided a, a negative or positive value. Uh, but we're going to say uh, increment. Uh, we're going to say player one dot Pokemon dot. Uh, we are using player one. All right, so we're going to use PP for the, the player one. And we're going to say minus, and we're going to say move.pp. And move actually wasn't a string, it was an object. Right. Um, and again, we're, we're, we have a lot of trust on what the client is providing us for this, for this example. We're not doing any kind of data validation uh, or anything like that. That's, that's a topic for another day, probably. Uh, we have player two. Uh, Pokemon.hp instead of pp, and we're going to say move.damage. Uh, so we're just going to subtract from the power points and subtract uh, from the health points for the two players. And we're just going to flip them in the else example, and I'm, I'm just going to copy it. And there's, way, there's, there's ways to make this uh, look a lot more clean and fancy, but for, for readability, uh, I'm just going to copy paste. And I'm just going to flip these. So this is going to be two. And this is going to be one. Um, and we're not expecting any kind of response because our change stream is going to handle that for us. Mm -hmm. um, so that's it, right? That should work. That is it. Let's let's test it and see if it does work. So yeah. I'll uh, switch back to the uh, UI here. And uh, we'll start up a new battle. So I'm going to refresh. We're going to get a new battle ID. Um, and, and actually, Nick, do you want to? Uh, oh no, you're not going to be able to join this fight because we're we're not deployed anywhere. But let's just pretend I will pick Squirtle. Which Pokemon would you pick? Uh, I would pick uh, against Squirtle. I'll always Bulbasaur. Bulbasaur. So so far, you know, we get the UI that we'd expect. We no longer get to select Pokemon for this specific fight because they are chosen. And we have our health points and our PP points, but actually power points. Uh, let's actually... And I actually think that it's going to be worthwhile to show the one that we've deployed to Vercel, um, so that way people can get engaged because we've been streaming for almost two and a half hours. Yeah, well, I will definitely share that link out in, in just a second. Um, I just want to show that we have our HP and PP, so we'll do Squirtle and yep. Bulbasaur again. And now, let's say I go first, and again, at this point, you can like spam the click button and win, but you know, we'll go off of the honor code. So I attack with Bubble Beam, and it costs three power points. 
So when I click it, three power points are deducted from Squirtle and 25 health is deducted from Bulbasaur. Let's say Bulbasaur attacks with the, the, the Vine Whip attack. So now Bulbasaur loses four power points, Squirtle loses 30 health points. And we just keep going back and forth, back and forth. And, you know, at this point we don't have logic for, uh, you know, you can go over your power points, go into the negatives and same for your health. Yeah. But uh, that's going to be kind of our final stage in the game where whichever Pokemon goes to below zero health first is going to be the loser and the other Pokemon left standing is going to be the winner. So let's go ahead and add that UI really quickly. Sweet. I think what we could do, uh, since there's still a lot of people on the stream, it looks like, is we could actually make it actually turn-based uh, if we wanted to. <laughs> log, right? Uh, we Get could try it. out of the way. <laughs> Uh, so let's go, let's go first add our, um, victory screen. So again, we'll add another component. I'll collapse the battle stage and we'll say const victory stage. And in this case, we don't need the, the Pokemon. We just want the battle. And from here, all of these components, I mean, they're just decorational components to, to display data. We're, we're not doing any logic in them. All the logic happens in our primary battle component with WebSockets. And to show how this looks, uh, we're going to create a new div. And from here, we're going to say, if in our battle, player one Pokemon.hp is less than or equal to zero, meaning that player one's health has been completely depleted, if that is the case, then we are going to render a component saying that uh, image class name equals width 64 to show a big Pokemon. And we'll center it on the page. Our source for the image is going to be battle player two Pokemon image. And actually, this needs to be. ASX. So essentially what this means is if Pokemon wants, if players want Pokemon health goes below zero, player two is the winner. So we're going to show player two's Pokemon as well as a message saying uh, player two won or player two wins. And let's also... At the class name of text center x for XL and font bold, just for some styling. And then we'll close that div. And then we'll make the inverse true. If player two, two's Pokemon health goes below zero, then we're going to show Pokemon one for, from player one and say player one wins. I, I just noticed, uh, I'm just reading through the comments. I didn't know my wife was lurking. I made a comment about her. <laughs> she commented back. <laughs> Love it. Hi. <laughs> um, so then we're going to add a final, third and final stage here to our victory stage. And this component is only going to be rendered if, um, if there's a victor, right? So to see how that's going to look like is... We're gonna have a condition if battle dot player one dot Pokemon dot HP is less than or equal to zero, or battle dot player two Pokemon HP is less than or equal to zero. So if either of the Pokemon's health drops below zero, we are going to display our victory stage and pass in our battle so that we know which Pokemon won. So with that said, let's go back in here. And again, every the reason we're not seeing previous battles is when we refresh the page, a new battle ID gets generated because we're not providing one. So let's just pick two Pokemon, have one of them win, and... Um, oh, so... All right. <laughs> so <laughs> it does work, but... This component gets rendered below our fight. And um, 
we're not hiding our, our fight component, but I think I have an idea of how to how to make this um, work. So why don't we do this? Instead of adding more logic here and complicating it in the UI state, figuring out if a Pokemon has less health, we'll do something tricky. And here, we'll make this fixed. And uh, we'll make it height screen uh, left zero, top zero, so that it's at the top of the page. We'll make the background purple. Uh, we'll make the text center, and we'll add some padding. So now, this is completely a, a UI change, right? So we'll have Pikachu fight Bulbasaur. Pikachu is going to win. And now player one wins. And that works. Should make its width full as well. So there we go. So Pikachu, Bulbasaur, let's have Bulbasaur win. Player two wins. Nice. <clears throat> um, and then finally, let's just add, like if you want to play again, let's just add a link back to the home page that says, hey, hey Trev, go back to the home page and let's say play again. So now if we have our fight, one Pokemon wins, play again link, you go back to the home page, you can click a new game and start start from scratch. So I think I think we've done it. We've implemented a very simple uh, Pokemon battle game uh, using, you know, thanking uh, the Poke API folks for providing us the, the images. Um, we've used Socket.io, MongoDB, MongoDB chain streams for the real-time interactions and then Next.js uh, for our front-end framework and Tailwind CSS to give us uh, the beautiful user interface. Uh, I know we went a little over time, but I think we- About an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've uh, we've done a lot. Uh, what do you think, Nick? I think this might be a yeah. good, like we can add additional yeah. features in a future stream, but let's open it up to, to our viewers and see if they had any questions, comments, feedback, liked it, hated it. And if you want to play with this demo, um, I'll share the link publicly oh, to the deployed we, application. I think we got to make the GitHub repo public, right? We do need to make the GitHub repo public. Um, if you want to demo the application and try it out yourself, this is the link. Uh, we'll make the GitHub repo public as well uh, later today, and we'll share that out on MongoDB and our personal Twitter accounts. Yeah. But. Uh, Thank you so much for uh, for tuning in, and we'll hang around for a few more minutes. See if there's any yeah. any questions, comments, feedback. Um, thank you for hanging so, out with us. So I, while the comments trickle in, I brought this up to Otto earlier. So I was thinking about doing a project uh, around Pokemon that had to deal with the Pokemon trading cards. So uh, they're they're a hot item right now. Um, so I was thinking it'd be cool to create. Rather than I, I know a lot of people use Excel to to manage their their trading cards, but it'd be cool to uh, manage the trading cards in MongoDB. But I also know that services like TCG Player also have APIs for getting the market value. So you, it'd be cool to maybe create like a a Pokemon trading card or just a trading card general application to to manage your trading card portfolio and and worth. I don't know. I thought it'd be pretty cool. I don't. Would anyone be interested in that if we were to try that? <clears throat> Let the comments trickle in. Any ideas on what yeah. you want to do, Otto, around this Pokemon stuff? Um, you want to get that denim suit, right, for the next one? I mean, I'm going to try. You know, the, the Pokemon shirt was, uh, you know, temporary, but I definitely need to match your energy. If we're going to do more Pokemon streams, like, we got to do it right. <laughs> um, but no, I would definitely like to, you know, continue building on this application. Like you said, you know, adding... Uh, turn-based control so that you can't just spam a button and win. Um, we could add maybe, you know, four-player battles or six-player battles and, uh, you know, make it like a MMO. Uh, obviously, I don't know if, you know, this was just a demo, but I'm sure the Pokemon folks wouldn't like us using their IP oh, yeah. for, for more stuff. But, you know, we could maybe create a MongoDB, uh, Mongo, Mongomon. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, like the South Park with the Chin, Mo Chin Pokemon South Park episode. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Um, but yeah, that, we'll definitely share this code. If you guys have any feedback, any questions, happy to follow up. And um, 
yeah, we'll, we'll bring we'll bring you more great Pokemon and MongoDB and Next and all sorts of technology content. Yeah, uh, I'm going to throw some banners up here just uh, while we're sitting here. Um, by the end of this, if you have any questions for us, join the MongoDB community. Uh, drop us a question, reference this uh, video or stream, um, and one of us will, will jump in and and uh, help you out. Um, and likewise, uh, both of us, we do we do post tutorials on the Developer Hub. Um, I've posted some Pokemon ones in, already. Plan to do more. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, other like game development tutorials and all kinds of fun stuff. Any plugs you want to give out, Otto? <clears throat> um, well, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that MongoDB has a podcast. Oh. <laughs> there is a um, podcast. If you are interested in uh, you know getting MongoDB on the go and hearing about some amazing stories from from developers from. MongoDB customers and how folks are using MongoDB. Uh, Nick, Nick and Mike Lane, they, they run a podcast that, you know, weekly, lots of really, really great content on there. Um, so check that out. Give us a, uh, give us a like. And finally, you know, hang out with us on, on YouTube. We are creating a lot of content there. We're going to do more live streams, more, uh, more content, and we really want to hear from you. You know, follow us on, on Twitter in the MongoDB community. Let us know what you want to see, and we'll build it. And it's pretty much all I had. Thank you. I think that's Thank all I have. See everyone cool. later. <laughs>